Hello, I'm Kelly Burkhart, and I'm the pastor here at Baptist Temple, and I would like to warmly welcome you to this hour of worship on the 17th Sunday after Pentecost. The focus of our service today will be on repentance and having the kind of faith in God that inspires us and motivates us to act. So now, in these moments to come, I hope that you will use them as an opportunity for prayer and reflection as you turn your mind's attention and your heart's affection on God. Testament reading today comes from Psalm 78, beginning in verse 1. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from old, things that we have heard and known that our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their children. We will tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might, and the wonders that he has done. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
one of the interesting things that my daughter, Brett Abigail, and I love to do is to watch boxing together. That may seem like an odd thing for a father and daughter to do together. And really, except for the two of us, no one else in my household has any interest in boxing whatsoever. And well, the truth of the matter is our interest in boxing, it's probably, well, it's probably a little different than you might expect, maybe even a bit peculiar. She's 14 years old now, but when she was probably three or four years old, we were snuggled up together on the couch watching TV and I was flipping through the channels and just happened to land on a, on a boxing match. Not really because I enjoy boxing, just kind of happened unintentionally. It just happened. And immediately when it came on the screen, she was transfixed by the action that she saw. And then when I, when I pointed out how you can see the impact of a really hard punch ripple through the boxer's face or chest, she thought it was the funniest thing that she had ever seen. And we spent the rest of that evening snuggled up together, cringing and giggling with each big punch landing. Even to this day, it's something when it's just the two of us together, she'll always say, Daddy, can we watch boxing? And how can I say no? So admittedly, as I come to this next story that I want to tell you to begin this sermon today, I, I feel like I have to admit that that's basically the, the level of interest that I have in the sport of boxing. But, but whether you have are a big fan of boxing or not, I think you'll find this story interesting. Back in the 1930s, C.D. Big Boy Blaylock, he was a, a six foot, six inch giant of a boxer. And he was taking on this shorter, stocky opponent. And in the sixth round of that fight, Big Boy took a, a vicious swing at his rival with one of those big, long, powerful arms of his. Just as he did, Big Boy's opponent stepped in close to him and his head caught Big Boy's arm inside the elbow. And with the opponent's head acting as a lever, somehow Big Boy's arm whipped around in, in a really unexpected way, making a full circle, and he ended up punching himself on the chin and doing so hard. After landing a blow to his own chin, Big Boy staggered around, grabbing the rope, walked, walked almost the entire way around the ring, and then fell flat and was down for the count. And as far as it is known, CD Big Boy Blaylock is the only prize fighter who has ever knocked himself out with a, with a right to his own jaw. It's kind of a strange story, but perhaps there is a strong message in that story for each of us, because this sort of thing, it happens more often than we might think. In fact, it's exactly what is happening in the text that we encounter today. The chief priests and the scribes, they square off against Jesus in a heavyweight match. They take a fierce swing at Jesus, but he steps in close to them, and they end up knocking themselves out. They came to attack Jesus, but he left them in a bad predicament, tied up in knots with the issue unresolved. Jesus employs this tactic often when he's confronted by his detractors with a conversational response. He, he just ties them up in knots. And, Really, it's almost as if Jesus is saying, oh, you're attacking me. Well, okay, I, now I've got you right where I want you. In a moment, we're going to look at this interesting parable that Jesus tells in this moment. It's often known as the parable of the two sons. But before we do, I want to give you some background information that I, I think will be helpful to us as we try to better understand what this text has to say to us. This text, it comes at a very dramatic point in the narrative of Matthew's gospel. Just the day before, Jesus has made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the, the arrival that, that we celebrate on Palm Sunday. According to Matthew, Jesus 
after this triumphal entry, he heads straight to the temple where he turns over the tables of the money changers and the merchants selling animals for sacrifice, and then he drives them out of the temple. Jesus' attack on the temple, it, it's aimed against the merchants and the bankers who would make a profit at the expense of, of ordinary Jews seeking to fulfill their religious obligations. But it's also an attack on the religious authorities who have condoned these practices. These are the officials who, in today's reading from Matthew, they question Jesus' authority. It's the sort of action that made Jesus very popular among the more common people. And we ought to have a lot of sympathy for the, the typical faithful person of Jesus' time. Like us, most people really did love God and want to serve him in their lives. They also loved their families, and they, they had to work hard just to, to get from one day to the next. Unlike us, though, most of them couldn't read. They couldn't read the Bible or anything else, and they didn't have other media to bring them words from all of the kinds of sources that you and I have. They did have their synagogue or their temple in Jerusalem, so the only words they heard in public, it came from, from those sources or it came from Roman authorities, with their official pronouncements. But they heard it must have been overwhelming in its complexity, much like the way that many of us feel about all of the words that bombard us from day to day. But think about this from their particular perspective. Here's just a little bit of a sample. I have quite a bit here in my notes, and I'll only give you just a little bit of it, a sample of the kinds of things that they would have heard in public. For example, they might have heard one Sabbath day from a chief priest, some, some quoting from Leviticus, something like, you shall not eat any abhorrent thing, you may eat any animal that divides the hoof and chews the cud, yet of those that chew the cud, you shall, you shall not eat the camel, the hare, the rock badger, because they chew the cud, but do not, not divide the hoof. I could go on and on. That's the kind of thing that sometimes they heard in the temple or the synagogue. The, the, relig uh, the civil authorities, they also made pronouncements. I found some obscure kinds of pronouncements that would have been available to people in Jesus' day that involved these complex sort of laws about taxes and how that renters should pay taxes and landowners pay taxes. All of it, really, it's dizzying and confusing probably to them and to us. It's kind of like us listening to, well, the FDA recommending foods and medicines and what is allowable and not allowable, or perhaps going and listening to some kind of obscure congressional hearing. Some of what they heard was just downright frightening. The rest of it was just downright confusing to their unsophisticated and uneducated minds. And then, here comes Jesus with far fewer words. Words that spoke more about love than rules. Words that often went like this, you have heard it said, but I say unto you. We don't usually find Jesus making a lot of finely reasoned, philosophically nuanced, doctrinal statements or listing rules. Instead, we usually find Jesus telling stories and doing good deeds. In fact, I think that really does sum up Jesus's ministry really very well. Jesus, most of his ministry was just telling stories and doing good deeds. And is it any wonder then that the people just flocked to him? He made sense to them. He offered love, not threats, and, and he asked for loving actions, not animal sacrifices. So he threatened the careful, ordered world the Pharisees said was necessary for, for the people to, to maintain their identity in the midst of this degenerate Roman world that they lived in. But of course,
worse, he, he threatened the power that the, the official people in the religious establishment, he threatened their power. He threatened their power to control the thoughts of the masses. So they know when they are confronting Jesus on this day that they have to be careful with their attacks because they don't want to stir up the common people who admire and, and love Jesus. And so they ask Jesus about his authority. And if they're not careful, they may just knock themselves out. Let's read the first part of our passage today, Matthew chapter 21, beginning in verse 23. When he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered, Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing this. As we move forward in this service, I, I think you and I need to be careful as we consider where we might find our own place in this particular story. I think for the most part, we would very much like to think that we are among those in the crowd on that day, those who are attracted to Jesus and are flocking to him. However, I'm not so sure that those are the people most of us would most closely identify with here in this story. For most of us, I think we likely have far more in common with the chief priests and the elders. Like, like them, we, we have at least some credibility in matters of faith. We too have formed our opinions and established our religious practices. The driving force behind so many of those things is what matches our preferences and our comfort and are not as focused on the things that matter most to God. We too seem to respond to the gospel as old news rather than good news. We too like to spend more time listening and studying and thinking about faith rather than doing anything with our faith. And then here comes Jesus. In their life and in ours, upsetting the order and balance that we've tried so hard to neatly compartmentalize our faith, and we often respond just as they do. We question his authority. We resist his authority in our lives because it makes us uncomfortable. But we should be very, very careful when we do this. Because in our effort to metaphorically take a swing at Jesus, we run the risk of knocking ourselves out, of finding ourselves far outside of the kingdom of God looking in. Let us pray. Almighty God, we have come to this moment to say that we love you. Primarily because you first loved us. But also because you create us and sustain us and shape us and teach us and redeem us. In you we find our meaning. In you we find our hope. In you we find the promise of who we can be. In you we find affirmation for what we've done right and forgiveness for what we have done wrong. We love you, Lord, but we don't always understand you. Even in the midst of our congregation, we embrace the dawn of future life and ministry that exists among the young children and teenagers. Yet we also mourn the sunset of faithful lives of ministry among those who have reduced capacities and abilities. And we confess there are times 
that we wonder why life must have this unbalancing balance. We acknowledge that there are some who, upon seeing the bad things that happen in our world, choose not to believe in you. But this is not the choice that we have made. Even in the presence of loss and grief, we've come to profess our ongoing faith. While some might think of us as being foolish for continuing to believe in a perfect God as we live in a robustly imperfect world, we respectfully disagree. Because for although our faith in you is, at the end of the day, faith, that does not mean that it makes no sense. We confess that we don't understand all things, but we do profess to be fools, O God may not be an easy truth that life has no meaning without the prospect of death or that winning has no meaning without the prospect of loss or that love has no meaning without the freedom to hate. However, this is the truth that we believe. We thank you for this church, O oh God, a place where we are not politely asked to check our brains at the door. We know that it is not a perfect place, but we are glad to have found it, glad to know that there is a place where we can wrestle with our doubts and be honest about our questions, but also a place where we can stand our ground. We stand with you, humbly yet confidently on the side of hope and love and grace and mercy and justice and peace. So now we join our voices together to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
first part of our text, Jesus deals with the questions about his authority from the religious leaders by using clever language to avoid falling into the trap that they have set for him. And then Jesus goes on the offensive, doing what he often does by telling a story. Let's look at that part of the passage now. It's Matthew chapter 21, now beginning in verse 28. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second son and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him, and even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want us to really focus in on that story because once upon a time there was this man who had two boys. I have two boys of my own and often want to get their help doing tasks that are important. And so he goes to these boys, first the oldest, and says to him, I need you to go and work in the vineyard today. Stubbornly, the, the boy replies, I don't want to. But later on, that boy thinks better of it and goes. And not knowing that the first son had decided to later go, the father goes then to the second son and, well, he says, your brother has refused to do the work and I need you to go. And so Betty Haskell answers saying, yes, sir, nothing would please me more than to do this work in the vineyard. I'll be right there. And if you fast forward the tape a little bit into the future, maybe two hours later, that very polite son is still lying on the couch watching TV while the first son is out working in the fields. Now, which of these two sons pleases the father more? The son who says he won't work, but then later does, or the one who promises to work and never does. It's really a no-brainer. It isn't what either boy said that's most important. It is what each finally did that matters. That's obvious, I think. And then Jesus, they make, he makes sure that, that they don't miss what he's saying, and he makes it the application crystal clear. He told those religious leaders, who are a lot like you and me, he told them and us which brother they were. They are the ones who say the right things. They are the ones who believe the right things. And they are the ones who stand for the right things. But they are the ones who don't do the things that God has asked them to do. So Jesus then, he says to these good Church people, I tell you that tax collectors and, and prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. And he says that right there in the holy temple where they, where they those religious authorities, they felt a, a, a sense of belonging, even a sense of ownership in that place. A place where tax collectors and prostitutes were obviously unwelcome outsiders. Jesus, he takes on these scribes and Pharisees, not because they say the wrong things. They said all of the right things. He takes them on because they don't practice what they teach. He takes them on because they, they mistake their, for their conviction about God for their obedience to God. He takes them on because the word of God had become old news for them instead of good 
And it's small wonder that on Friday of that same week, Jesus was executed. These same chief priests and elders of the temple, they make up a group of people who put Jesus on trial and condemn him to execution on a cross. We hear this story and we are on the side of Jesus. Where else could we be? We like that he puts down these self-righteous people. But however, as I've said before, the problem is that some days this parable, these words that Jesus spoke on this day, they're about us who are hearing them on this day. I found recently a, a poll that 84% of Americans say that spirituality is important in their lives. When asked, when do you feel the strongest connection to God in this same poll, 40% of those people said that they felt that strongest connection to God when they are praying alone. And I think that's a fine answer. 21 responded that when they are, they, they felt closely connected to God when they are out in nature. And I also think that's a fine answer. 21% said that they, they, they felt the connection to God in a worship service. And I really like those people. 6% said that they felt that connection to God when praying with others. 2% said they felt it when reading a sacred text. And one of the things that stuck out to me was that they didn't even have a category for acting on your faith or doing what God commanded. Because unfortunately, we've come to this place where we believe that religion is something that you think. Religion is something that you feel instead of something that you do. So often, churches are long on words and short on deeds, spending more time discussing the church than being the church. Assuming that we know what it means to be a Christian is, is the same as, as living as a Christian. And understanding everything about faith except that it's supposed to be practiced. It's easy to get beliefs mixed up with actions. Churches are tempted to talk about the poor and never share what they have to agree on the importance of Christ, but never tell anyone that we know about him. So to applaud our knowledge and ignore what we fail to do. Barbara Brown Taylor puts it this way. She said, there is no shortage of people who say, believe, or stand for all the right things. There have always been plenty of those in the world. What God is short of are people who will go where God calls them and do what God gives them to do. Maybe we have such good imaginations that we actually believe sometimes that we've done the things that we've really only thought about doing. Have you ever thought about visiting a sick friend, rehearsed what you wanted to say, and then decided to send a card instead. Thought about a nice gesture, what it might be, and congratulated yourself even on, on, on your thoughtfulness and then just let it go at that. Sometimes we have a hard time remembering whether we even sent the card or not. We believe in doing kind things, but sometimes we don't do them. We just think about them. It's easy to, to create not only the outward appearance of, of a Christian, but the inward assumptions too often that we substitute for, that we substitute belief for obedience. The theological word for the distance between what we believe and what we actually do, that theological word is sin. For finally, it tears us up to think something and then never act on it. It tears up our family, our friendship, our church when we talk about love and act with indifference. Or say right and do wrong. Or say, I'll go and then go nowhere at all. If we're not careful, we spend our lives in the batting cage and never play the game. We study the cookbook and never enjoy the meal. We learn the lines but never raise the curtain. 
we keep spouting the right opinions without doing anything about it, then we'll end up empty. We keep talking about doing good and never do it. It steals our soul. And I know this from experience, and so do you. There is incompleteness in professing Christ without living for Christ. When we first hear this story, we may think that Jesus outsmarted the Pharisees by using their own methods against them, but nothing would have made Jesus any happier than to have these Pharisees finally, finally say, well, I get it now, that there is this, this joy of living in faith. Jesus wants them to learn a better way. Jesus wants them to say, I need to stop thinking that holding the right opinion is enough. That I need to start caring with my hands as well as with my heart. Pharisees thought they were doing the right things, but they had gotten so attached to their own ideas about what those things were that it was hard for them to listen to Jesus. Jesus suggested that they trade in their beliefs for a fresh experience of God. They just couldn't let themselves do that. They thought they said yes to God, but were not being obedient to the things God had asked them to do. And back to that parable, both of those sons in the parable, both of them lied to their father. Neither son gets it completely right. And even after we've said no, even after we have rejected God's guidance with our disobedience and laziness, God will still welcome us if we find our way to the vineyard and work in his field. Jesus warns these scribes and Pharisees because Jesus recognizes that they're missing the fun of it. The difference between talking about the Christian faith and living like Jesus is the difference between reading the sheet music and singing the song. The reason God wants us in the vineyard is that there is more joy in loving your neighbor than there is in knowing that you're supposed to. We always have the possibility of saying outlandishly joyful things like, I have some extra flowers, can I plant them in your yard? Instead of nodding as we walk past Friend, we can stop and say, I, I hear you're having a hard time. I'm going to take your children off of your hands for a few hours this afternoon. We can be the people who actually write notes and visit the hospital and bring people to church who don't have cars and tell people why we love Jesus. We can study the Bible not to see what we can learn, but to see what we can become. Pray not to tell God what we need, but to ask God what he needs from us. Christ's church needs to be filled with Christians who have figured out that the joy of faith is in the action, and not merely the word.
God of our salvation, we falter before the demands of your word and turn away from your call to life. Pour out your mercy on us as you showed mercy to your people of old, that we may turn from our sinfulness and walk the path of self-emptying love. Accept our humble gifts, forgive us when we fail you, and lead us to repentance and the acceptance of your grace through the love of Jesus Christ our Lord, the one whom we praise and adore, and in whose precious and most holy name we pray. Amen. We remember that all that we have is God's. It is as an act of worship with joyful hearts and out of an abundance of riches that we return now to God a portion of that with which he has blessed us. Give now as God leads you.
This morning when I was getting ready to make my breakfast, I opened up the refrigerator door and there was this intense smell of something awful. After a little bit of looking around, I, I found at the back of the refrigerator some, some fish that had been in there way too long. It had been forgotten and well, it had done, it did what fish does when it's forgotten. It, it turned terribly bad and my, my nose, actually all of my being, essentially became aware of the bad fish the moment I opened the door. And in some ways, this passage that we've considered today, it has that same kind of effect on us. It, it reveals to us that, well, something in our lives is, is off, it's fraught. But, but that's not the only message that this passage has. In fact, if we'll allow ourselves the opportunity, this passage, it also gives us the chance to experience God's grace. Because at the end of the day, this passage, well, the point of Jesus' parable really is that, that first son. He is the one that was doing the will of the Father. The one who, at, who had at first said no, but later changed his mind. That last part of verse 29 is absolutely critical. He had first said no, but he changed his mind. And he did as the Father had requested. That's the key phrase. And it's something that, that Jesus pointedly emphasizes. Jesus' question, it's also a question that he asks to us, which of you does the will of God? Which of you is willing to change? That really is the gospel, to enter into God's story and to become a part of God's plan. Jesus calls us to a changed mind and a new way of thinking, a new way of believing. And out of that comes a new way of doing, a new way of acting, and not incidentally, a new way of living. There are other words for that idea of having a changed mind in the Bible, words that we typically don't use in polite society, but it's a word that is repentance. It's a word that starkly reveals that what we, re what we do, it really matters. Indeed, the, the crowds, they bear witness that, it, that the, the tax collectors and the prostitutes and other notorious sinners, they are responding to the good news, saying no at first, but then saying yes in the end, repenting and turning and changing their minds. It's all about our responses to God's gracious invitation to become part of the kingdom work in God's vineyard. God wants us to say yes and really mean it. God wants our yeses to be real yeses, and God wants us to repent for the times that we've said no. And God wants us to be all that we can be. God wants us to say yes to that gracious invitation to kingdom work. God wants us to say yes and to do yes and to live yes and to be yes. God invites us to join him. He invites you to join him. God wants to redeem us. God wants to free us from our small thinking and our small ways of doing. God wants us to be faith-filled and faithful sons and daughters who rejoice in doing the work of his kingdom. The only question that remains is, how will you respond to his invitation? Will you say yes or no? But ultimately, the thing that matters most is what will you do? Thanks be to God.
may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and grant you peace. May the Lord give you the grace to never sell yourself short, grace to risk something big for something good, and grace to remember that this world is now too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. Now may he take your minds and think through them. May he take your lips and speak through them. And may he take your hearts and set them on fire in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.